In life, we have certain things that just stick with us. And one of those things that stuck with me was a quote that I heard during a conversation about life. The quote says, success is not measured by what you accomplish, but by the opposites you have encountered and the courage with which you have maintained the struggle against overwhelming odds. There's a few things in that quote that stands out to me, but the one I want to focus on today is the word struggle. Now, the struggle is something that many people who grew up in less than ideal situations talk about. Those people who grew up on those oodles and noodles and chicken pot pies. Those people who had to go find a way to make money to bring in because their parents, our parent was going through it, trying to make sure they had food and a roof over their head. That's the kind of struggle that teaches you at a young age that you're going to have to grind to get out of your situation. And many of those people do grind, hold to be the lucky few who were blessed enough to make it out of that struggle. As you can see, I keep going back to that word struggle and even try to paint that stereotypical image of what the struggle looks like, but that's for y'all to imagine it a little. Now take that and imagine it being way worse than I just described. And then imagine someone actually being in love with that struggle. To me, that's crazy to imagine. Because while struggles are important for growth, you don't have to love the struggle. You just have to tolerate it until you get out of it. But no, nah, this man was actually in love with it and had a greater appreciation for it than most. And today we're going to cover his whole story. This is what happened to Ben Wallace. Ben was born on September 10, 1974 in Whitehall, Alabama to his mother, Sadie Wallace. Ben was the 10th out of 11 kids his mom would end up having and the youngest out of the eight boys. His oldest brother, James McBride, also known as Rev, was 20 years older than him and had kids around Ben's age that Ben looked at more like siblings because they were closer in age. Now, the city where Ben lived was actually an old slave plantation. So many of the homes and cabins that people lived in were old slave homes. And even during the time where slavery was abolished, many of the jobs that were offered in this small town were jobs that the slaves used to do, which is crazy because Ben grew up in the 80s, early 90s. But even during those times, they still were picking cotton in the area that you know Ben lived in, which is just mind blowing to someone like me. Especially hearing how Ben described it as the closest thing to slavery that was possible during those times. Now, Ben and his family were poor. They lived in a small three bedroom home, and there would be 12 to 15 people who lived in the home at a time. Knowing they were poor, the kids had to help out so they could make sure everyone was fed and had the essentials. So many of them worked in the fields at a young age, and their mom, Sadie, actually had to make many of their clothes that the kids would wear to school herself. And Ben can even recall a time as a kid when he went to school with no shoes because he outgrew the one pair they had and his mom couldn't afford a new pair of shoes. And in that moment, thinking to himself, do people not see what we're going through? And mind you, this is a kid thinking about how can people ignore their situation and not do anything to help, which is crazy because most kids don't think that deeply about, you know, what's going on. But that's what the struggle can do to your psyche. Now, I'm going to briefly cover his relationship with his father because there isn't much there but I feel it kind of adds to his story and just the environment that surrounded his early life because his father actually walked out on the family early in his life and Ben didn't really reconnect with his father until he was about 15 years old when he actually sought him out to have a man-to-man -man conversation and get some stuff off his chest. In that conversation, Ben learned about some of the demons his father was facing and troubles he was going through. But even though he can understand what his father went through, he still had mixed feelings about his pops because regardless of what he was going through, he walked out on the struggle that the entire family was going through and Ben couldn't respect that. Now, sadly, his dad would pass away about three years after they had that man-to-man -man conversation. Now, I know I just talked about the environment he grew up in and the stuff that he had to deal with, but it wasn't all bad and actually his childhood was better than most would expect. The reason for this is because he was loved and his mom did the best she could to make everything fun and enjoyable while also teaching him and his siblings the joy of working for what you have and Ben took his mom's teachings to heart. One of the first examples of this is when he was young, he wanted a basketball goal in his backyard so that him and his friends could hoop on it. To earn the money for the basketball goal, Ben, his nephews and siblings went to a farm who hired daily workers paying the workers $15 a day to pick pecans. They took the money they earned and bought a steel rim that a guy was selling for about $20. They then built their backboard from wood that they had in the barn and fallen tree that they found in the woods. After it all came together, Ben and his people were excited and he realized just how true his mom's words were about how much better it feels to work for something than to be given it. Now that probably flew right out the window once he realized he forgot one of the most important things you need to play basketball, which is an actual ball, which they forgot to get. 
But that was just one example of Ben applying his mom's philosophy as Ben was just a natural hustler and worked for everything he had. Like in his free time, instead of hanging out and kicking it with the boys, Ben would be on his porch offering $3 haircuts to anybody who wanted it. And sometimes he'll be out there for hours just cutting hair. And most of the money he made, he gave to his mom, even though she told him that he could spend it however he wanted because he earned it. So Ben, being who he is, you know, with that natural hustler's mentality, used some of it to invest in some new clippers, as well as pay $50 to attend a camp that was being hosted by Charles Oakley. Now, up to this point in the video, I haven't talked much about the basketball stuff, but that changes here because this is where his basketball journey really kicks off. Now, before I talk about his time at the camp and what it did for him, I want y'all to keep in mind by this time in Ben's story, he was about 16 years old and was already a pretty good basketball player and athlete in general, earning all state honors in basketball, football, and baseball. But even with those accolades, it still wasn't enough to put him on the radar of college scouts because they didn't know how his skill would translate to the next level because at this time, he's a gritty 6'6 center who is offensively challenged and that skill set just doesn't work at the next level according to the scouts. Now, Ben didn't care. He was all about proving people wrong and at the camp, he got an opportunity to show what he was about and he did just that actually pressing charles oakley to the point that oakley took a liking to ben and started supporting him in a mentor's role that relationship he had with oakley would really help him along his basketball journey but not immediately because after high school he still didn't have a single college offer so he did what many young men do when they don't get an offer but still want to continue chasing their hoop dreams and that's go the juco route he attended Cuyahoga Community College in Cleveland, Ohio, and he played ball for both the years he was eligible, and he even averaged 17 rebounds and 7 block shots per game his second year. After graduating from Cuyahoga Community College, he got the opportunity to play at Virginia Union University, a NCAA Division II school, after receiving a special recommendation from Oakley. At Virginia Union University, Ben averaged 13 points and 10 rebounds per game for his college career. He was also named the Division II All-American and graduated with a bachelor's in criminal justice. After graduating, Ben declared for the 1996 NBA draft, but unfortunately went undrafted. After going undrafted, Ben went and tried out for the Boston Celtics, but was cut from the team. After being cut by the Boston Celtics, he didn't get another tryout, so he went overseas and tried out for a team in Italy. He made the roster but left the team after just one game because they didn't pay him after the team lost. So he left, as he should, and came back to the States. Now at this point, he's an undrafted free agent that isn't playing anywhere, so it's probably about time to hang it up. But nah, Walls waited and actually caught another break, this time with the Washington Bulls who gave him a tryout, and this time Walls took it personal because he knew he belonged in the league and could play with the best. He just needed to get his foot in the door, and that's what he did with this tryout. So he made it to the end, just barely making the team as the 12th man on the roster. He signed a one-year deal for $247,000, which is more money than he has ever seen in his lifetime. So I know it must have felt good to get that check, and I think Walsh would agree because one of the first purchases he made was for a truck that he bought off his teammate Chris Weber, a Scarlet Chevy Tahoe, a beauty. That thing was pimped out. It had two TVs in it. It had a VCR. It had a PlayStation for the boys. Shit, it even had seat massagers, so it was lit. Now, me telling y'all about this truck is going to be important later, but for now, let's talk about his first season in Washington, which wasn't all that special. Ben rode the bench majority of the season, only appearing in 34 games, playing garbage time, but even though the minutes he was playing really didn't matter in the grand scheme of things, Ben still went out there and played his heart out, coming at players with ferocious defense, diving for loose balls, just being a menace in his limited time. And his effort didn't go unnoticed, because that summer he signed another one-year deal with the Washington Wizards after surviving another training camp, where he was almost cut, and yet again, making the roster as the 12th man. Now, the start of his second year was just like his rookie year. He barely played any minutes and even received multiple DMPs, but he started to catch a break around November, getting a chance to play in a stretch of games, and over half of those games he played, he received double-digit minutes, which was rare to see. During that stretch, he continued to make a case on why he should receive more minutes, and he wasn't doing this in the conventional way by putting up numbers. Instead, he was doing it in that way that can't be measured through the box score, but is supported to winning which showed as his minutes increased after that stretch of games. And by February, he even earned a couple of starts, starting in 11 games that month alone, which is impressive because he only started in a total of 16 games that season. During that stretch, he averaged 29 minutes per game, five points and eight rebounds per game. Now that things have started to look up for the kid, life interrupts and messes the whole vibe up. 
Like they said, you can never get too much of a good thing. Something bad always happens to balance out all that good. And unfortunately for Ben, the bad came in the form of that beautiful truck he purchased last year. As while he was away with the team on a road trip, someone came and got up off of him. Taking the truck and stripping of all his valuables, which I knew hurt Ben because that was his baby, his first big purchase. He spent 20000 on that truck. And that was about 10% of what he made when he got his truck. But that's cool because there was a lesson to be learned there, which was be wise with your money because imagine that he didn't get that next contract. He would have lost 10% of the money he earned from playing ball, which probably will leave him with like 20% of his first contract after taxes and fees that he would have to pay his agent if he had one at the time. The good thing is that Walls took that lesson to heart, just like the rest of the lessons he learned throughout his life, and applied it as he picked up less expensive hobbies like RC cars. But let's get off that topic and move on with the story. Ben finished his second year appearing in almost double the games he appeared in last season, appearing in 67 games, averaging about 5 rebounds on a block in his 17 minutes of action a night. After his second season, Ben signed a two-year $1.7 million contract with the Wizards, which was perfect time because of the lockout. After the lockout, Ben picked up where he left off last season and became a mainstay on the Wizards rotation. He appeared in 46 of the 50 available games, starting in 16 games. He also led the team in rebounds and blocks with averages of 8 rebounds and 2 blocks per game. After the season, the Wizards were looking to shake up the roster, so they traded Ben to the Orlando Magic during the offseason. Ben would spend one season in Orlando where he started in all 81 games he appeared in. At this point, he was starting to get more recognition for his hellacious defense, which was wrecking havoc on offensive players. He did see a slight decrease in numbers, but the impact was still there as he was constantly on the floor for loose balls and disrupting passing lanes on the regular and just making winning plays on defense like he always has. He finished the season averaging 8 rebounds, 2 blocks, and a steal per game for the Magic, but was once again traded in the offseason in the deal that landed him in Detroit. After arriving in Detroit, he signed a six-year, $30 million deal, becoming the Pistons' second-highest-paid player. Now, people really didn't watch Wallace play, probably thought it was an overpay, which is understandable because his numbers don't tell how good he was since he only averaged five points and eight rebounds per game in Orlando, which is not going to oppress the average fan, but he quickly caught their attention during his first year in Detroit as he turned defense that was ranked 21st in the league a year prior to the eighth-best defense in his first year with the team. He finished the year averaging 13 rebounds, 2 blocks, and a steal per game. He also finished the season second in rebounds per game and first in total rebounds. Now, while he had a pretty good season, the Pistons as a whole had a disappointing season as they only won 32 games in Ben's first season, which was 10 less than a year prior, which is somewhat expected since they did lose arguably their best player, as well as the team had to change in philosophy with the new personnel, so all these things contributed to a down year. But things will quickly change in Ben's second year as he had a let me introduce myself season. As the Pistons flourished under new head coach Rick Carlisle, the team went 50 and 32, earning the second seed in the Eastern Conference, with the biggest reason being the defensive excellence of Ben as he averaged 13 rebounds, four blocks, and two steals a game, which earned him his first Defensive Player of the Year award. He was also named first team all defense and third team all NBA. Now, in the first round against the Raptors, Ben had an all right series. He wasn't as defensively dominant as he normally was, but it was his first playoff series and he still did his thing. He averaged 15 rebounds rebounds, two blocks, and two steals per game, and the Pistons won the series against the Raptors, but lost in the next round against the Boston Celtics. The offseason, the Pistons shook up their roster when they signed point guard Chauncey Billups, as well as trading lean scorer Jerry Stackhouse to the Washington Wizards for Rip Hamilton. This helped reinforce the idea of the Pistons being a gritty blue-collar team who used their defense to win games. Now, even with the adjustment, the Pistons' record did not improve as the record was still 50-32, and 32, but they were a much better team as they went from the 8th-ranked defense to the 4th best, and their net rating as a whole increased from 2.4 to 4.2, giving the team the 5th highest net rating in the league, and Big Ben was a big reason for this, and for his contributions, he was rewarded with his first All-Star appearance as he averaged a league lead in 15 rebounds to go along with 3 blocks per game. He was also named first team all defense and second team all NBA while also winning his second defensive player of the year award. That year in the playoffs, he would help lead the Pistons past the Orlando Magic team that gave them fits in the first round as well as the Allen Iverson led Sixers 
but would unfortunately have the season ended in the conference finals against the defending Eastern Conference champion New Jersey Nets. Now, even with the success, the Pistons team was looked at as an overachiever as they didn't really have any traditional stars. And with that being the case, it was even more of a shocker when they fired the man who many people credit for this team's success in Rick Carlisle, who just won coach of the year. After firing Rick Carlisle, the team hired 76ers coach Larry Brown, who was known as a veteran head coach who had a knack for getting a lot of teams with less talent. Even after yet another adjustment, Ben stayed Ben and did what he always does, and that's go out and cause havoc on defense. The Pistons were having yet another good season as they were one of the best teams on defense throughout the season behind Ben's excellent play and leadership on that end. But they still were a step behind the divisional rival Indiana Pacers, but a midseason trade will ultimately take the team to another level as the Pistons traded for another Wallace to pair with Big Ben. After the trade, the Wallaces took the Pistons to another level defensively, holding opponents to 80 points per game, which was 6 points better than what they were doing before the trade. The Pistons will finish the season with a record of 54-28, and 28, and again, Ben Wallace was arguably the biggest reason why in the league knew, as he made his second consecutive All-Star team, as he averaged 12 rebounds and 3 blocks per game, he was also named first team All-Defense and second team All-NBA. Now, heading into the playoffs, there weren't many expectations for the Pistons, as many believe the Pacers who looked like the best team all season had the best shot of coming out of the East. Now Ben didn't worry all about what others thought of his team because he knew what his team was capable of and did his thing as a leader of the team's defense. And his leadership was shown throughout the playoffs as the team was significantly better with him on the floor. The Pistons made it through the first round nearly sweeping the Bucks, but had to fight tooth and nail to make it through the Nets who they lost to last year as the series was decided in game seven, which matched them up against a team they knew all too well and the Pacers, coached by their former coach and Rick Carlisle. In game one of that series, the Pacers got them in a hard fought game as both teams failed to crack 80 points. Ben had 22 rebounds and five blocks in that game. The series was straight brutal. Most of the games were slow and grinded out with tons of cheap shots, making it a very ugly series that was decided in game six with a 69 to 65 win for the Pistons. Ben had a double-double in the deciding game with 12 points and 16 rebounds, getting the Pistons back to the finals with the most unlikely group of characters. In many people's eyes, the Pistons didn't belong in the finals. They literally had one all-star in Ben Wallace, and he wasn't a prototypical star. He was a blue-collar guy who did all the small things that go unnoticed, the dirty work that goes unappreciated. He was the real leader of what became the best defense in the league since the all-star break. And truth be told, he was the Pistons' best player. And if an undrafted guy who can't put the ball in the hoop is your best player, how in the hell do you get here to the biggest stage in basketball? And to make things worse, they're up against NBA royalty in the Los Angeles Lakers, a team at the time that already had 14 championships, a team that featured four guys who will all be in the Hall of Fame someday. The team with the most talent in the league, that's who Ben Walls will have to overcome, and nobody believed that was possible. Matter of fact, the Pistons were plus 500 and the Lakers were minus 700, which in betting terms, is just saying the Pistons are massive underdogs. Then the series started and the impossible became a reality as the Pistons completely outplayed the Lakers, beating them in five. As Ben Wallace opened the door by playing Shaq straight up the entire series and doing just enough to make Shaq's life hard, while also allowing his team to focus their energy on Kobe and not have to deal with the physical toll of banging down low with Shaq. He took all that in and became an NBA champion, which he probably never thought was a possibility. Finally, after fighting tooth and nail just for the opportunity and barely surviving early on in his career, he was at the pinnacle of NBA glory and will be immortalized in NBA history. Coming off that championship run, the Pistons were on a new high as many believe their championship was fluky and the Pistons actually started off the season rough and things will only get worse in the eighth game of the season the Pistons played, their conference and divisional rivals in the Indiana Pacers and arguably the most infamous moment in basketball history will happen. This moment is a combination of so many things that came to a head all at once. Each person involved actually deserves to have their side of the story examined, but right now I want to focus on Ben because this is his story and probably the thing that most people remember him for, unfortunately. But I want y'all to hear his side of the story from a different perspective, not the perspective that the mainstream media was painting of the situation, because just a little over a week before this happened, Ben had lost his oldest brother, a man that was like a father to him, a man who constantly worked with him and supported him and taught him how to be a man because his own father wasn't there to do that for him. Ben had crazy love for his brother because his brother was a major factor in his development and losing that man was hurting him. And honestly, he wasn't even supposed to be at that game. He was supposed to be grieving and getting his hair right. 
but he's trying to be there for his team because it's a big game as they're playing their rivals. He's at this game dealing with everything he's dealing with, getting blown out by the Pacers, and then Ron Artez does a foul that was just unnecessary because the game was already decided, and I can see why Ben reacted the way he did because enough is enough. He's just trying to play basketball, but you want to be on some petty shit, so I'm going to give you what you're looking for, and that is why he shoved Ron Artez into the 10th row. And I'm not saying he was right because he wasn't, but I do understand the reaction and where Ben was coming from. And I bet after everything cooled down, he probably regretted his decision and being involved in one of the worst events in NBA history after the Malice in the Palace. Ben Walsh was given a six game suspension for his involvement in the brawl, which honestly wasn't that bad compared to other suspensions that were handed out. Also, fortunately for Walls, he was able to bounce back from those events and help get the Pistons the second seed in the East right behind Miami. He averaged career high in points that season to go along with about 12 rebounds and 2 blocks per game. He was named 3rd team All-NBA and 1st team All-Defense while earning his 3rd All-Star appearance to go along with his 3rd Defensive Player of the Year award. Now once the playoffs kicked off there wasn't a ton of competition in the first 2 rounds even though they did end up running into the Pacers in round 2. It was a less competitive series because the Malice were moving one of the Pacers key players as well as the Pacers really never catching rhythm after those events. The first real challenge came against the Miami Heat who were the number one seed in the East after acquiring Shaq in a trade during the offseason pairing him with a young superstar in Dwayne Wade. The series was a good one going all the way to game 7 and Ben played great defense on Shaq again and actually had the best defensive rating in the series. This got the Pistons back to the finals for the second year in a row and Walls played one of his best series averaging a double double with 10 points and 10 rebounds to go along with 3 blocks a game but it wasn't enough to overcome the Spurs who won the series in a tough game 7. After the finals loss, the Pistons came to the next season with a chip on their shoulder and the Pistons will finish with the league best record of 64 and 18 but while they finished with the best record in the league, Walls had yet another great year, continuing to make the Pistons one of the best defensive teams in the NBA. He was named to the All-NBA second team as well as first team All-Defense yet again to go along with his fourth consecutive All-Star appearance and the ice on the cake was he became the only other player to ever win four Defensive Player of the Year awards in NBA history. Heading to the playoffs, the Pistons knocked off the Bucks in round one, but had to scrap in round two as the Cavs gave them all they can handle in a seven game series that the Pistons won, making it their fourth consecutive Eastern Conference Finals appearance, where they would lose to the Miami Heat, who had some give back for them for last year. Heading into the offseason, Ben was in line for a new contract as he just played the last year in his current contract. Now, most people didn't see Ben leaving the Pistons as he was pretty much the face of the team, and the team put it out there that they wanted to retain him. But actions speak louder than words because while they wanted to retain him, they wanted to do it at their price, which was around 4 years $48 million, which Ben felt was a bit too low and tried to negotiate more, but the Pistons were stuck at that amount as they said the players with Ben's skill set wouldn't be worth the money by the end of the contract as he would be around 36 years old when his contract was up. In the end, the two sides couldn't agree on the numbers, and Ben decided to sign with the Chicago Bulls, who offered him four years, $60 million, which made him the third highest paid center behind Shaquille O'Neal and Jermaine O'Neal. Even though he was sad to leave Detroit, he left on good terms, thanking the organization for the opportunity to make a name for himself. Now, even though money was a factor in his departure from Detroit, it wasn't the only factor, as the other factor was a desire to continue to compete, which he believed he could do with his young Bulls team, who had just came off a season where they made the playoffs and took the eventual champions to six games in the first round, as well as flaunted to their roster that had up-and-coming players in Kirk Heinrich, Lou Aldang, and Ben Gordy, and with this core, they were able to be the seventh best defense in the league, and they believed that Ben Walls was the missing piece that could take them to the next level, and he was excited for the new challenge, but unfortunately, it would be apparent early on that this partnership wouldn't work. As once the season got rolling, there seemed to be a disconnect between Walls and the front office, which continued throughout the season as there were many minor conflicts between him and Coach Scott Skiles, as well as GM John Paxson, one of the most notable surprisingly being about him wearing a headband, which went against the Bulls' policy of no headbands. On top of his conflicts with the front office and coaching staff, his play on the court with his young core didn't always mesh the best as he had a way of doing things that were different from how the young guys did it, which makes sense because he came from a veteran heavy team that understood roles and how to win games, which wasn't the case for this Bulls team even though they did a fine job the year before without him. They didn't take that next step like Wall suspected them to once he got there. Now regardless of the bumps in the row, the team did fairly well finishing with a record of 49-33 and which was good for the 5th seed in the East. Ben averaged 11 rebounds, 2 blocks in the steal a game on the season as well as was named all defensive second team in the first round. The Bulls will play the Heat 
who they lost to last year but was sweeping the first round and Walls really showed out on defense giving Shaq hell throughout the series. Now unfortunately Ben and the Bulls playoff run would end in the second round as they lost against Ben's former team the Detroit Pistons. After losing in the second round Walls will play a little over half the next season with the Chicago Bulls before being a part of a huge trade that sent him to the Cavs. He stayed with the Cavs for about another season after beating Trey there but would eventually be traded again this time to the Suns in exchange for Shaq and after being acquired by the Suns he was bought out and weighed by the team before ever playing the game. After being weighed by the Suns, he decided to make a return to Detroit, signing with the Pistons. He would play three years in Detroit as a decent role player before retiring at the end of the 2012 NBA season. Now initially Ben struggled with retirement because he had yet to identify the next chapter of his story. So when he first retired, he did what most retired people say they're going to do. He spent time with his family, which is awesome, but the problem is he was spending too much time and it started to drive them crazy because they got their own stuff going on and he was that guy with the completely empty schedule being a pest. I know some of y'all know that one person who ain't got shit to do ever, so they're always trying to get you into something. Yeah, that's who he was and honestly, he was that person for pretty much the first two years of his retirement as he dealt with depression. Which makes sense because coming from where he came from, he worked really hard to make something out of himself and his hard work paid off, blessing him by making all his wildest imaginations a reality, giving notoriety, fame, fortune, awards, admiration, basically everything that most people are looking to obtain throughout life. And even though he still has money and is financially stable, he's realizing that he lost his purpose and that money couldn't fulfill him like he probably initially thought it would. Now one of his lowest moments came in 2014 when he was charged with a hit and run after hitting someone's fence and then got out of his car and fled the scene on foot. He was sentenced to one year in jail but his sentence was suspended and he only served two days with one year probation. After that situation I believe that Walls didn't like the person he was becoming and started to take the steps he needed to take to find his purpose again. So he reached out to his former coaches and Rick Carlisle who steered him in the right direction and hooked him up with some contacts to people who can help him out. He also reached out to Mike Woodson and Doc Rivers who both gave him some useful information and put him in the right direction and by 2018 he re-entered the basketball landscape this time as part owner and chairman of the Grand Rapids Drive NBA G League team. He also had his jersey number retired by the Detroit Pistons in 2016 and after an amazing career he was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame in 2021 adding yet another accomplishment to his basketball journey. I just want to be honest with basketball. Basketball was not my life path. Basketball was just in my life path. I took basketball and I created a path for those who helped me. I took, I received, I gave back. I laid a path, I laid a track. It should be easy to find. I was stuck in it for quite some time. When I move forward, no is not an option. I keep marching, lions fight. Dogs fight. The Virginia U University Panthers, we march. And if you follow our lead, if you lead, I'll follow. You guide me, and I will finish when I get there. Stand tall. Stick your chest out. Keep your head up. If you build it and you can't tear it down, you got lost at the top. It's lonely at the top. Real leaders lead from the bottom. I take all my, I take all my brothers and my sisters, my mothers and my fathers. I take them with me. For when I fall, you keep marching. Leave me there. I'll get up. I'll be stronger. I'll keep marching. Life is not hard. Life is very simple. Life is what you give it. Life is what you take from it. You give life. You take from life. How much do you take? How much do you leave behind? One blessing at a time. The toughest part of life is the most underrated part of life that you would ever hear about. 
Winning look good. Legacies are built. Legacies are built to last. But what, what type of legacy are you building? What protects your legacy? I tell you my legacy. I wasn't welcome. I was too small. I couldn't play the game the way they wanted me to play the game. Sound like an uneven game to me. Put me on a level playing field, and I'll show you. Panthers March. Ben Wallace's journey is really amazing when you look at it. And I know I've said that about all the players I've covered in these videos, but honestly, none of their journeys could be as difficult as Ben Wallace's. I mean, he was brought up in what was pretty much modern day slavery. He was the 10th out of 11 kids. And while his mom always did the best she could to make sure that he could enjoy life, she couldn't offer all the benefits that many of us take for granted. But beyond all the obstacles of just being a poor black kid, he still had struggles to establish himself in the basketball world. He didn't get a single college offer, so he was forced to play Juco. And after having a great Juco career, he still didn't get an offer to play at a D1 school, so he had to play D2. And even after proving himself at that level, people scoffed at him and said he was too small to be an NBA player. So he went undrafted. And after going undrafted, he was cut after his first NBA tryout. So he had to go play overseas to keep his dream alive and luckily he was able to get another chance but even after receiving another chance he just barely makes it past the final cut and which he had to do so twice because he was almost cut during the second year in the offseason he went through all of this just to get his foot in the door which is already amazing so him just stay in the league would be impressive at this point but no he ends up becoming one of the greatest defenders in nba history winning multiple defensive player of the year awards making multiple all-star appearances and all nba appearances winning an nba championship and ultimately earn his spot next to the rest of the basketball greats by being inducted into the nba hall of fame his story is a real start from the bottom type of story and the thing i take away from his story the most is that he never talks about the times where he was struggling in a bad light. Instead, he talks about it in a very appreciative manner, that love for the struggle that built him into the strong man that he is today is something that he appreciates. And honestly, it reinforces the idea of still worrying about everything that's going on around you, focus on yourself, appreciate the good and the struggle, and make the most out of every moment. And never forget what got you to where you are once you make it out of the struggle. Because once you obtain everything you desire, what drove you to get to where you are is what's going to be the thing you cherish the most well that's it for the video i hope that y'all enjoyed it and if you did leave a like and subscribe and i'll catch y'all on the next one peace